it is 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here in New York City. So with that, I'd like to welcome everyone. Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our 2016 webinar series on the topic of using the Lean Business Model for social innovation. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about our webinar. Social entrepreneurs are concerned with solving urgent social challenges by applying business techniques and private sector approaches. To succeed, startup social enterprises must first invest in defining their own business model and articulating how they will achieve their intended impact. An incubator Good World has worked with numerous social enterprises to do just that across India and Africa. So we've invited Paul Belknap, the lead for Vilgro's health incubation team, to share how Vilgro utilizes the business model canvas to help their startups focus on finding scalable business models to solving social challenges. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C webinar series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming installments in this series, as well as archive videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars webpage and you can see the link right there on the slide, along with our YouTube channel. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Webinars. Before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge hub and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources, opportunities such as jobs and fellowships, and a growing database of hundreds of poverty alleviating products in the solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better you'll be able to, will be able to, able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join E4C's passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Today's webinar is a collaborative effort with the ASME iShow, a hardware-led social innovation competition open to individuals and organizations taking physical products to market that will have social impact. Previous iShow sponsored webinars focused on issues related to hardware-based solutions and provided practical insights from the iShow expert network. We invite you to check out the recordings on the E4C professional development page. And you can see a list of the webinars we've previously hosted on the slide here. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. We'd love to see where everyone is from today. So in um, the chat window, which is located to the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. And I will get us started off so with my location so everybody can see what I mean. There we go. I'm here from Brooklyn. I see folks from Minnesota, Lake Tahoe, Indiana, all over the United States, Michigan, <laughs> New Hampshire. Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Well, we have some international attendees. Welcome to those of you joining us from Mexico. So if the chat is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon on the top right-hand corner of the screen. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go into the chat window. You can also feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin if you have any issues. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you have. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located directly below the chat, to type in your questions to the presenter. That way we can make sure to keep track of them. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the icon on the top right-hand corner of the screen. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, 
try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PDH for the session, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page. So the URL is listed right here. And welcome, welcome to everyone from Houston to New Jersey to Brooklyn to the Netherlands. So we're very excited to have you here with us today. All right. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Paul Belknap, leads the health incubation work at Velgro. He joined Velgro after spending five months working as an MBA Without Borders advisor to the organization, um, during which time he helped the company with business development and internal information flow. Paul holds an MBA from Penn State's Neal College of Business, during which time he was the president of the Net Impact Chapter. Prior to completing his MBA, he worked for five years as a mechanical engineer and designing capital equipment for the paper industry. Much of his time was spent working on a number of new product development project teams. Uh, Paul also, also participated in and led multiple internal process improvement teams. So we're very excited to have Paul here with us today, joining us from India, and I will turn it over to him. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Yana, and um, yeah, greetings to everyone today from uh, Bangalore, India. Um, I hope everyone's off to a good start to the day. So I guess if I can get a little more feedback um, from the audience, it would help me present a little bit today. So you can just enter that in the chat window as well. Um, it'd be great to hear how many of you are kind of currently starting um, work on a product that's intended to create impact uh, for low-income people around the world. Um, that can help me kind of, um, you know, understand if you guys are more generally listed, interested in, um, you know, just learning about the business model canvas or if you intend to kind of apply it to something you're already thinking about. So I guess before we get started, um, I just wanted to um, well, kind of a quick credit to Alexander Osterwalder and Steve Blank. Um, a lot of this material is adapted uh, from their work um, and definitely greatly appreciate it and encourage you to check out the great work that they've done and I'll reference a couple of specific examples of that. Um, we've definitely benefited greatly from it. Whenever we talk about the business model canvas, we always step back and um, think about, you know, what is really the purpose of the startup? Um, because that is, uh, you have to kind of frame the purpose of the business model canvas uh, within that. Um, and so a startup is really a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Um, and the startup really exists to iterate on that and pivot until it finds the thing that it's looking for. Um, and then it often turns into more of a traditional organization, but it often looks very different until it accomplishes that initial goal. And you know, one of the things that that organization needs to do is understand what its mission is and what is driving it, you know, what, what context it is trying to build that business model within. And so we need, you need to define the mission of the company, and that really can be boiled down to who do you serve and for what purpose. And the goal here is to define a mission statement that is specific enough that it gives you some constraints to work within, but general enough that it will be durable through um, you know, the inevitable pivots that, that you'll face as you, um, you try out different business models and different product configurations and really try to find that fit that is scalable and, um, and also makes the impact that you want to make. So we want to answer the question, um, and this is a good exercise to go through before you actually start working on your business model, is to identify this mission and answer these questions. The challenge here is to do it in roughly eight words, uh, less than eight words. And that typically what we, what we found is that, that that gives the right mix of specificity to give you some good bounds to work within but also keeping it, it somewhat not too specific where you start defining, for instance, the product that you're building um, rather than the mission you're trying to accomplish or the people you're trying to help and, and how. So, so the challenge there is to you know, limit it to about eight words. Um, Vilgro has managed, as an example, has managed to get it to four, making impactful innovators succeed. And 
you know, each word in here really has to hold its own weight and carry itself through and justify its position in this mission statement. So we start off with action saying we're going to make uh, these impactful innovators succeed and we define who we want to help and how we want to help them. Um, so this is something that I think we always suggest people start with before they actually jump into the business model canvas because it gives you a really useful context to work within. And it's, um, you know, because there will always be trade-offs as you're developing your business model canvas and as you're, um, you know, really working through your startup. Um, and really the, the tough challenges really come when you, when you start actually trying things on the ground and you need to make tough decisions about things that are working and things that aren't. Um, one, one great example of this is we were working with some uh, entrepreneurs interested in uh, solving uh, the problem of access, access to female hygiene products here in India. And they started up this, uh, you know, that, so that was essentially their mission, was to make uh, female hygiene project, products available uh, to people in rural India. They started up a rural distribution network, um, came up with a, you know, and started working on education around menstrual hygiene and things like that. But then, um, and they started adding a few other products to the to the sales basket so that these women entrepreneurs could have a sustainable business. Um, and what they found is after a few months is that the women were selling everything but the feminine hygiene products. And they faced a really difficult decision to, and ultimately shut down a successful distribution channel um, and business because they didn't, they knew that they weren't accomplishing their mission. And I think that that's why it's important to really understand what you're trying to accomplish before you set out. Um, and it's good to even understand that before you start sketching out your business model. So. Moving to the next slide, we're, we're looking at what is a business model, and it's really nine components that come together to really outline the business. And um, these, I think what we found is that they're, um, they fully define the business, but they're also fairly flexible, um, and they can fit a lot of different contexts. They define how the organization creates, delivers, and captures value. Um, the numbering of them is um, important. We kind of start with the core of the business and then build outwards from there. And, you know, I think there are a couple of other things to mention about the business model generally before we dive into, you know, how you build one. First of all, we prefer the business model canvas over um, a business plan because we see it as something that is more comfortable and more practical as a living document. Um, where something that you should be revisiting as you learn more about your customers, about your value proposition, um, about all elements of the business model. And so you want to, we, we see one of the strengths of this is that it should be iterative, it should be something that you have up on your wall that you're revisiting consistently. Um, and so that's really critical. The other thing to mention is that you'll often develop multiple uh, examples of or multiple versions of the business model as you're uh, even sketching it out initially. You may have multiple ideas about primary customer segments or value propositions that you want to deliver. Um, and sometimes if you just have two customer segments, um, you can just list those on one, one version of the business model canvas. But if you start realizing that those two customer segments each require different channels, different customer relationship strategies, uh, different key resources, partners, then it's time to create two different uh, business model canvases. And that really is good to highlight to you how, um, how different those two customer segments may be and how difficult it may be to serve both of those segments um, as a startup because startups do have limited resources and it's important to kind of focus those resources. So it's a useful tool from that standpoint as well. Um, and it can often uh, highlight which ones, uh, which of those two customer segments or which of those two opportunities, say, um, within the customer relationship management are more manageable for a startup and may direct your strategy um, in a particular direction. So with that introduction, um, we'll move into the beginning of the business model canvas, which is the value proposition, which is really at the heart of uh, the business model canvas, which is why it's right in the middle. Um, before I proceed, the whole um, another kind of 
overall topic is that the value proposition and everything to the right of it are often referred to as the front stage um, and they're the, the customer facing side of the business model campus. So you can kind of see the right side is really the customer facing side. The left side is really the, the, back, the backstage um, or the, you know, the delivery side about how you deliver that value proposition to the customer. So that's another way to kind of organize this um, in your head. Value proposition really defines what are you building and for who. And you know, we've actually argued about this a little bit internally. The customer segment and the value proposition really could both be labeled one. They're, you can't think about one without the other. Um, but the value proposition is really most core to this. Um, and it could potentially be delivered to multiple customer segments. But you, so you really have to start thinking about those thing, those two things, at this almost at the same time, and start iterating between the two. So we'll move on to thinking about how you actually design a value proposition. And so this is an area where uh, Alexander Osterwalder really developed the business model canvas um, and the, and the materials around how to put this together and realized that the core and the foundation of the business model is really in the value proposition. Um, and so he then went back and wrote a book specifically zooming in on designing the value proposition. I've gone through this book, I've presented on this book, and it's absolutely fantastic. If you're at the stage of your business where you're really trying to understand your customer and figure out what you are trying to build for them, I would definitely recommend um, you know, looking that book up um, and using some of the materials and the, um, it's a very practical way to structure your thinking. Um, and I definitely think the materials walk you through a really structured, uh, logical process about how you understand your customers. So I would highly recommend looking that up if that's uh, a place where you are uh, with your uh, idea at this point. Um, and so we're kind of going to do just a quick quick dive into that, but you can really go into detail on this, and this is really important to get right. If you get this right, everything else will flow from that um, very logically. So you start off by understanding your customer jobs, and really to do that, you need to talk to, I often say 50 to 100 customers. Now, in some cases, in a in kind of a B2B setting, you know, there may not be 100 customers out there within your context, but I think that the point of really making sure you talk to a large number of, um, of customers is really important. And so the first thing you want to understand is, you know, the customer jobs. What are they trying to accomplish within the context of the product or service that you're trying to develop? Um, and some of these jobs will be just the functional jobs of getting a task done. Some of these jobs will be emotional jobs. So for instance, um, you know, the, if I'm thinking about the customer job of, hey, I want to go on a date on Friday night, um, you know, the functional job would be I want to spend time with somebody, I want to you know, do something fun. Um, then, but another example is um, thinking of one of our entrepreneurs has developed a, a neonatal temperature monitoring uh, product, which helps with uh, maintaining healthy weight gain and keeping infants out of hypothermia in India. And there's the functional job of just alerting the mother if the child's cold, but there's also um, a lot of social jobs that the customer is trying to accomplish in terms of um, satisfying extended family and things like that that are really critical and that the product can help the customer with. Um, and so along with the customer jobs, um, there are also pains. And these are risks that the customer sees related to accomplishing that job, um, negative consequences socially, functionally, et cetera, um, that the customer faces as they're trying to accomplish these jobs. And those are things that make them kind of dread doing these tasks and things that, you know, obviously you'd like to help them avoid if possible. And there are also gains. So there are, th there are more positive things. Like if you can provide a really great experience on my date night on Friday night, um, then you know that can be a really positive thing for me as well. So it's not all bad. It's also there's some positive opportunities there. So the um, there are a number of human-centered design tools that you can use to get to that um, to the customer um, profile. And you know as I've brought up here, you can use the empathy map. Um, that's one that we've used a lot. 
um, what does the customer think and feel? What does the customer see? What does the customer hear? What do they say and do? Um, what are their pains and gains? And you know, this would all be within the context of those jobs that they're trying to accomplish related to uh, what you're developing. As I, as I uh, alluded to before, the, um, the materials within the Value Proposition Designer book are also really good in a structured way to step through this. Um, so that's one way that you can handle this. Um, and then, you know, if there are other tools that you're more comfortable with, um, I think they all work really well. And it, it, as long as you use something to structure your thinking, I, I think they all kind of do a, a very good job of it. I would say that what I have, what I've seen is that some entrepreneurs um, don't approach this in a structured way, and they tend to struggle. So the, the key takeaway here is use whatever tool you like to get to understanding the customer jobs, the pains and the gains. Just make sure you use a tool so that you're structuring your thinking um, in a meaningful way and making sure you're asking the right questions. Um, so once you've, once you've kind of gathered that information, you need to rank the customer jobs in terms of importance to the customer. You need to rank the pains and the gains in terms of importance to the customer. Then you really start on designing the value proposition. And the value proposition is just the list of products and services that you're putting together. Um, and it may be a mix. It may be a handful of pro a couple of products um, or features um, that the products need to have. This is really defining the requirements for uh, what it needs to deliver um, to the customer. And then um, so you're putting those things together in a bundle. And then you're defining how those, that bundle relieves the pains that the customer has and also creates gains for the uh, customer. And the key here is to really, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to define um, a problem, or a, sorry, a product or a bundle of products and services that necessarily addresses every single customer job every single pain and every single gain. Otherwise, you know, I think we as engineers have often been accused of trying to create things that are a little too, um, you know, have too much going on and over-engineered. Um, you really need to focus in here, um, and the way to address that is to focus in on the top, you know, two or three most important jobs, the most important gains, and the most important pains. Um, and if you can address the top ones um, with a nice, concise product, then you'll be off to a really good start in terms of establishing a value proposition that your customer will be willing to pay for. Um, so with that, you now have kind of created a value proposition. And another way to think about this is that your customer segment is all understood through observation, um, and it really explains the why of why you're building what you're building and what you're developing what you're developing. And so then the value proposition is what you end up creating, um, in order to address the customer's needs. And so that's done through design, and then you end up creating a value proposition. Um, so we've already really kind of drilled into the customer segments. Um, there are a couple of, of notes here. I, you know, I think we've under talked about already how to stand your customer segment. But there are a couple of things that I think are particularly interesting um, when you're doing this for a social enterprise. Um, and one of the key things here is to understand that your customer segment is often your purchaser and beneficiary, uh, maybe different people. Um, social entrepreneurs often end up with even more stakeholders than that who may have an influence in the purchasing decision. And so that's something to keep in mind here is you need to understand potentially multiple customer segments, and it's good to list those here. So, um, you know, in the case of medical devices where I work, um, you know, the, the customer um, in India or in the U.S., uh, the, the user of many of the products is not necessarily really the decision maker because the doctor has most of the information and they kind of, the patient does whatever they say. Um, and so it's important here to define, you know, who's making those purchasing decisions, who is the um, decision maker potentially on other criteria, and then who is the actual end user. Um, and you need to make sure that things are lined up for everyone. Um, otherwise, and that there's a, there's a strong value proposition for at least the most important stakeholders, 
or your product will struggle with adoption. So um, this is this is an important criteria to keep in mind um, as you're designing your product and you're designing your value proposition. I think that's something that um, other entrepreneurs face um, in terms of having to deal with multiple customer segments and a disconnect between beneficiaries and purchasers and things like that. But I think social entrepreneurs often end up with a more complex web of stakeholders um, than, than others. So just something to keep in mind as you're building this. Moving along to channels, um, you also need to define how does your product get to the customer? Um, and that's a really critical piece um, that is particularly challenging in many um, developing countries where the distribution channels are often much more fragmented um, and challenging to navigate. I, I had a friend who was worked at a multinational both in the US and in India and was uh, working in the supply chain side of things and was just uh, spent about a year here uh, in the middle of his time with this company and was just shocked with how, how much more challenging it was um, to do logistics here in India. Um, and so that's an example of you know, how it is uh, you know, potentially very, you know, just something you need to keep in mind as you're building your product. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that um, you need to take into account how complex and how big of a behavior change um, your product or service is for the customer. Um, and the more complex, uh, more education is needed, uh, the more behavior change is needed uh, for your product or service, the further to the right of this slide you'll probably need to go um, in order to uh, get your good adoption of your product. Um, the downside is the further to the right that you go, the more expensive uh, the channel is to the, to the company and the more um, it's a direct expense to the company where um, you know, you're taking on a lot of risk if the product doesn't sell. Because uh, you typically, as a, as a young entrepreneur, will only have, uh, or a young business, you only have one, one product. And if that's not selling, um, you've got a kind of a fixed expense of your sales force and, and not much revenue coming in. And that can be a tough, tough thing to deal with as a small business. Um, if you do have a product that's more of a pulp product, very more similar to other products in the market, then you can move towards the left, towards um, wholesalers, partner stores, and those are cheaper ways to sell, but they can't typically can't do any concept selling for you. They can't do um, any real customer evangelization for you. Um, and you know, I think the uh, the company that I worked for here, um, Sustain Tech, uh, which was selling commercial wood cook stoves uh, to small roadside eateries here in India, has really you know they've been in business for I think. Uh, six or seven years now, um, and they've had to maintain their own sales force, um, even with a fair a, a product that isn't a huge behavior change um, from the existing products. But it does require a fair amount of education um, to to explain to customers why it's better than the competition, uh, partly because it doesn't look so much different than the competition, and so um, that's something that you have to consider and build in as you're you know, kind of thinking about your, your business model. So those are some examples of um, you know, how your channel will operate. Again, thinking about different ways that your distribution will work. These are just some examples, really kind of get the juices flowing. Uh, there are many other opportunities here. Um, there are lots of times that you will need to innovate here um, to, to really reach uh, your customers, develop partnerships with uh, aligned organizations um, like NGOs and, and things like that. Um, and that can fit into your channel strategy sometimes. The other thing is, you know, that I think a, a social entrepreneur needs to think about is how you manage your customer relationships. And the customer relationships really deal with once you attract your customers, once you get them to buy your product, how do you keep them and how do you grow them? And I think that I've seen this can be particularly challenging for entrepreneurs um, working in emerging markets where connectivity isn't quite as good sometimes or um, customers are more likely to change phone numbers or move their business 
um, without without informing um, somebody, things like that. And so it's it's something that is increasingly a challenge. I think that um, you know there are solutions in terms of digital platforms that can help with this. Um, this is just again um, a, a few kinds of customer relationship management options that are there, um, ranging from personal assistance, um, really as, as some of the more hands-on and costly options, all the way down to community and co-creation type uh, customer relationship uh, and self-service customer relationship management, which are maybe a little less, less expensive. Um, again, you need to match this to the value proposition that you're delivering and the customer segment you're working with. How capable will they be to manage an automated service? How, you know, if you have a very concentrated customer base of, you know, a handful of five clients, um, you probably need personal assistance because every client counts a lot. If you have thousands of clients, personal assistance probably won't be an option. Um, but, you, you know, you really need to match that to um, the skill level of the of the client, the um, you know the complexity of the product, and all of the things that really you you already will be thinking about um, in terms of developing your value proposition and understanding your customer segment. You just need to make sure that this is aligned with that uh, those two two buckets. And so then moving along to the last box on the right hand side, uh, revenue streams. And so this is how you make money and you make the business sustainable and scalable. And, um, you know, I think this is an area where social entrepreneurs have uh, really innovated a lot. Um, you know, the most traditional business model is really the asset sale. You know, I sell you a, you know, a, a, a widget and uh, a watch um, or a solar lantern, and then, you know, you pay me cash for that up front. Um, more and more, we're seeing things like solar power delivered on subscription models. Um, you know, I think we've seen increasingly um, here in India, um, as an example, the um, a lot of farm equipment is needed on a seasonal basis. It's often not particularly affordable for a, a small farmer to buy a certain implement uh, because he only needs it for a handful of days a year. But it also, you know, gives him significant labor savings. And so we've seen a lot of people doing product as a service. So potentially through an intermediary, um, somebody buys this equipment and then rents it out. And when you think about the fact that, it, you know, maybe this product will be delivered as a service, you need to think about the fact that there's a, a farmer as your end beneficiary um, and a, you know, a, an equipment renter who is, or a service provider really, um, who would be the actual paying customer. And this comes back to thinking about those multiple customer segments that you need to address um, in order to really you know, make your product successful. Um, but so we've seen a lot of interesting models springing up there where um, you know, potentially uh, where people are seeing good results with um, the rental of, and of agricultural equipment for, um, for some of these very seasonal products that uh, that are needed, but but not necessarily something you want to have around all year. So moving along, uh, just kind of stepping back and realizing that we've just completed the right side of the business model canvas, which is um, really the customer facing side. It's the understanding the customer and creating a value proposition based on that. It's building up our channels. Uh, and customer relationships, how we manage our relationship with that customer segment, and then um, also what, how our revenue streams come in based on that. Now we'll start at the left-hand side, and just to note, we've actually renumbered the, um, the key activities, resources, and partners uh, because we think it, it makes a little bit more sense um, to think about it this way. So just in case you noticed that discrepancy, that was intentional. Um, and it, so I think we'll walk you through why we're, we're thinking about it that way. So the key activities are what's the most important thing for the business to deliver that value proposition. What, what does the business need to do in order to really um, you know, wow the customer with a value proposition that they have to have? And so there are three, um, three main buckets that that lives under. 
And those are um, production uh, and then potentially also service delivery and then a platform. Um, and so production is really, you know, what you're thinking about in terms of a physical product um, or even, you know, some uh, other options there. Uh, problem solving service is often associated with consulting, but it can also be, um, you know, the uh, what I just talked about, where uh, an enterprise might choose to provide um, some kind of physical product as a service to its customers. Um, and then finally, um, a social media platforms, and there's other platforms that can help cost, uh, farmers uh, construct agricultural linkages, et cetera, uh, networks of information that help them uh, understand how to get better prices for goods, understand uh, best planting practices, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, as you're defining um, your key activities for your business, you'll want to get into a lot more detail than I'm really discussing here. But, you, you know, these are three buckets that can kind of get you started. Some businesses will really only have activities under one of these. Others will have um, a few activities listed under two or three of them, um, depending on the nature of the business that you're trying to provide. Um, keep in mind that, you know, as a startup with limited resources, you will need to focus your activities pretty carefully. So next is key resources, and we really look at the fact that the key resources are the things that are the most critical parts of the key activities of the business. And so what are the most important assets that your company has um, in terms of delivering your value proposition? Uh, what of the key activities do you really want to take control over? Uh, you know, understanding that you're a startup with limited bandwidth, you know, what, what do you, are you not comfortable sharing with um, a, a partner? So those may be physical assets in the case of um, a production company. Those may be intellectual assets in the case of, you know, if you've developed some interesting intellectual property for your business, um, and they, or, or also in the case of a, you know, a consulting type firm. Uh, they may be human resources in terms of developing a, a distribution or sales force, and they also could be financial resources in terms of providing financing um, to to individuals uh, in the case of microfinance um, or other innovations where people are helping uh, low income individuals access uh, improved livelihoods through uh, financial services. And again, these are these are kind of the buckets that you would want to arrange uh, your resources under. But you should go into um, some detail here in terms of kind of. Uh, identifying those key resources um, and, and understanding which ones you really have to have internal to your company. And so the key partners, um, really, if you take, if you start with your key activities and you list out your key resources, uh, the things you have to do internally, your key partners should really add up to anything that's left from your key activities. Um, and there may be a few additional things under key partners, but um, if there's anything in key activities um, that isn't accounted for under key re resources and key partners, then you have a you have a problem and you need to figure out how you're going to accomplish that. And so you know it's things like partners, um, suppliers of raw material, um, potentially go to market partners, anything you're outsourcing, um, whether that's some of your production activity, um, whether that's design and R and D. Um, and there's a lot of reasons to do this. Uh, for a social entrepreneur, oftentimes, you know, the product development process may be a one-time activity um, or something that, that needs a specific input from uh, something that's a high, fairly highly specialized skill set, but then won't be needed and not doesn't make sense to have around over the long term uh, for the business. Um, there's also a lot of key partnerships that uh, social entrepreneurs would form that would help them reach their customers. And they may not quite fit into the channels bucket, but they would be an important partner in terms of really maintaining a customer relationship or um, you know, some other organization that just gives the, the entrepreneur the reach that they need um, to, uh, to reach their customers. Uh, and they, they do provide you some more flexibility 
um, than necessarily developing every single capability in house um, from day one. Um, and these, you know, these can be fluid um, as you uh, as your business evolves and you understand your business model better. Um, I think that's one of the key takeaways here is to uh, make sure that you're always evaluating whether or not um, a partnership or you know a key partner needs to change to something you're doing internal or vice versa, uh, based on what you learn about your business model. And so finally, the um, the cost structure really takes into account um, all of the activities on the left side um, of the business model canvas and says, you know, what does that cost us to deliver uh, this value proposition um, and our channel strategy and customer relationships to the customer? And um, you know, as you know, you want the basically you want box nine to end up to be less than box five and then you have a profitable business. And that's, that's a pretty big simplification, but ultimately that's what it boils down to. Um, and that's the kind of businesses that we're um, supporting at Vilgro is ones that really do have a sustainable and scalable business model um, that, can, that can really grow and um, serve a large number of customers. And so um, it's, it's important to understand your costs, um, to think about those up front and make sure that you have something that make some financial sense before you embark on that journey. Um, there are, you know, there are lots of opportunities often to reduce your costs um, as you scale up, uh, but you need to understand and think realistically about how that's going to happen uh, as you scale. So now we've kind of walked through the business model canvas um, and covered all the buckets here and, and what they each contribute to, you know, really how you, um, you know, how you reach your customer and deliver that value proposition. Wanted to reiterate at this point that it's often good to develop two or three different versions of the business model canvas based on, you know, potentially different customer seg segment strategies, different value propositions, different channels, et cetera, that you think are, are highly probable ways that it could turn out. And then those are things that you can go test. And as you're doing this, you should always be designing the whole business model canvas from the customer perspective. Um, that's really a critical element here, is that you think about this from the customer perspective. You design your channels, you design your key activities, all thinking about what the customer needs. And I like to think of this, you know, if you're familiar with lean, uh, lean manufacturing, it's only do what the customer uh, needs. So thinking back to those customer jobs, the um, gains and pains, and thinking about what they need in that value proposition, and then making sure that every activity, every resource, every partner that you're designing in this business model canvas is something that they need. And if they don't need it, then it shouldn't be there, and Lean would think of it as waste. So to kind of translate this into that language, um, try to keep this whole thing lean in terms of how you're designing the business model canvas. Now, what we've done here is talk about how you would, you would sketch out a business model. Um, realistically, even if you spent a fair amount of time talking with some of your customer segments, there's still probably a lot of assumptions that you're making. Um, and it is admittedly quite difficult often to get real good answers from customers when you come to them with a bunch of conceptual questions. Um, and so what you've got now is, is some things that, to varying degrees, are assumptions. And you're, you're basically guessing um, about what all of these boxes are. And so the, the next job is to really admit that to yourself and identify two or three really critical assumptions that you're making. You know, is it the channels that kind of make or break your business? Is it the key resources within your team that are going to make or break your business? And then your next job is to really go test those um, in a structured way. Uh, go out, go back to the customers with some, with an MVP prototype, with a box that you know is starts that conversation. Figure out how you can do it in a lean way to start testing each of the boxes on the business model canvas, starting with the ones that are really the make or break aspects of your business. And so that's, that's the next step once you, once you think you're done, you start testing and 
you really walk through and test the whole thing. And so with that, I think we've kind of um, been through the whole business model, been through the process of how you then identify the most important parts to test. And um, hopefully that's helpful in terms of thinking through how your um, ideas can really create an impact um, for low-income individuals um, in, in the emerging markets. And I think now we can open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Paul. This is very insightful and, and very visual. So I think uh, that, that our listeners are very appreciative of that. And we already have some questions coming into our Q&A channel. So I encourage those of you who have questions to please uh, populate them there. So um, uh, the first question is, uh, this individual says, we have several products uh, at the social Enterprise Institute that, oh, no, I'm sorry, these are, this is a comment for another individual. All right, so replacing the revenue and cost with a customer focus on the revenue and cost, i.e., what will they earn and pay for the product, and how does that relate to achieving the value promised with a strong customer ROI? Um, so I, I think I'll just restate the question to make sure oh. I've understood it well. Uh, yeah, so I think you, you do want, so that's a great way to think about this is you do um, you want to think about this from a customer perspective um, and you know really you start with understand and we encourage entrepreneurs to do that and that's a key piece of understanding you know what what you can charge for a product so you start with um, okay my customer is and this is where I, I went back to um, so this is a good example to talk about agricultural equipment so if there is a, um, for in instance, a sugarcane planter um, here in South India, and the planting season for that is, say, 45 days long, uh, twice a year, and you know your machine costs $5,000, um, and then you have to understand, you know, if this equipment rental person is going to buy that piece of equipment. How much can the market bear? You know, how much can a, a farmer afford to pay um, that rental agency to to rent this machine out? And so, if you you can kind of multiply through, okay, this guy can get you know X dollars uh, for 90 days a year. Um, it starts to give you a an understanding of whether or not um, this is going to be a, a good rental value proposition for that customer, um, or for you know for the equipment renter and then you also understand um, from the uh, sugarcane farmers perspective okay so what's the what's the how much is he paying for labor today you know and that's going to be a big driver of how much he's willing to pay for a rental um, to somebody that might own this piece of equipment and so you you know we do encourage the entrepreneurs to kind of um, and we work with them on this, where we think through, okay, what's what are the the economics for uh, the farmer? What are the economics and the value proposition for the equipment renter? And then how does that translate into is this a I don't know, profitable product for you to even produce? Um, so I th I hope that answers the question. But yeah, you can apply this at different levels um, to really kind of understand whether this makes sense for for everyone involved. Yes, and I think you've actually addressed another question that came in through the chat about the importance of having people or communities in developing nations pay for at least some of the product. So in the case of this particular organization, they are developing low-cost aquaponics, and they want uh, the customers or the users to be able to maintain the systems after uh, you know the, this group leaves, but also don't want finances to be a deal-breaker. So perhaps uh, can you speak a little bit to uh, maybe hybrid models or, or approaches where uh, you know costs are shared somehow across a, a number of organizations, perhaps from your experience um, in terms of this uh, cost structure. Yeah, so um, you know I think those are those are complex, um, and I'll so I'll I'll start with that. Um, but I think we've seen interesting models where, um, and we do always we have always shied away from companies that are giving away anything. Um, I think a really good example of this is, um, you know, a lot of the clean cook stoves that have gone out there, 
I think there's multiple case studies about adoption challenges with some of the clean the the household clean cook stoves um, that were given away. Now, some of the ones that have required um, some payment by the customer um, have turned out to do pretty well. Um, and I, so I do think that, you know, to the, the question or the person who asked the question's point, um, making sure that the customer has some skin in the game is really important. Um, and so, you know, I think what you have to do is look for a cross-subsidy model where, um, you know, the value proposition and the economics make sense for everyone involved. And, you know, that is often a tricky balancing act. Um, I think we've seen a lot of places where um, that hasn't necessarily worked out, but I think it, it comes down to really, um, in, uh, in management consultant speak, aligning incentives for everybody. And, um, you know, you, it takes a lot of study and probably a lot of experimentation um, to get that piece right. Um, but I think it's about understanding what, what value the product delivers for um, each customer segment and then going from there. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that we're seeing on the medical devices side is that there are a lot of opportunities to sell some of these products at significantly higher prices, both in upmarket uh, situations in India, the, the higher end private hospitals, as well as in developed markets like the US and Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And so some companies are able to kind of develop a couple of versions of products off the same core technology um, and then d charge a higher price for one. And then the low cost version, they, they have a lower margin on. Uh, they still make money. The customer still pays for it. But they maintain profitability and scalability by, you know, kind of having multiple product versions um, that uh, leverage a couple of different segments. So that, that can be one way to kind of cross subsidize. Absolutely. And if um, folks and listeners out there are interested in checking out uh, some really specific examples, uh, the Engineering for Change Solutions Library includes the BioLite cook stove, since you spoke about cook stoves, uh, Paul, uh, which is an organization that, in fact, uh, uses that type of hybrid model whereby they have a high-end product that is targeted for uh, developed markets uh, that subsidizes the cost. Uh, for a por portion of the cost for uh, a much more uh, scaled down version uh, with still good performance in uh, developing regions. So I'll include a, a link to that later for anybody who's interested in diving a little deeper into this particular example. A number of questions are coming in, so hopefully we'll be able to tackle most of them. Um, so uh, with the business model canvas, obviously it is a great tool for uh, continued experimentation to refine your value proposition and, and really are arrive at the right business model for your organization. The question here is, uh, should it be shared? Uh, is it a, a, also a good alternative to a traditional business plan for the purpose of sharing with potential financiers or funding grantors? Is it appropriate? Yeah, so that's actually, sorry, I, that's a great question. Uh, thanks for asking that. Um, I forgot to mention that up front. One of the, I think, the primary benefits of the business model canvas is that it is a good common language for entrepreneurs and investors to kind of come together around. Um, and I, so, yeah, we, we encourage entrepreneurs to share them uh, with us when they're, you know, when they're doing fundraising or when they're fundraising um, from other investors. I think, you know, yeah, I obviously want to think about who your audience is and what, what level of detail you're sharing. Make sure you're comfortable with that. But I think the more you can share with investors about even the risks that you see within your business model, um, the more seriously they'll take you. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a great communication tool um, to share with investors and really get that conversation started about where the opportunities and the challenges are. Mm -hmm. So one very specific question is, and perhaps you can speak to some of your experience, if anybody within the Velcro network has applied the business model canvas to sanitation services in the developing world? So I think um, the, uh, the, the question hopefully was, how do, how do you gather customer insights? And I'll, I'll answer that question. Uh, hopefully that's the right one. Um, so, you know, I think it, it really depends on, um, you know, your context. And I'll speak to the, um, the couple examples that I know. 
Um, so one of them is agriculture. And, um, you know, what we found is that uh, there's, at least in India, there's um, an active uh, agricultural outreach program uh, that's, that's been in place for quite a while um, and is very effective. And um, so the entrepreneurs often start with, you know, really approaching them, um, getting some introductions from the local, the local extension officer. And then, um, you know, once they start networking into the, to the local farmer community, um, you know, as long as they're asking good tweet questions and, um, you know, having, uh, treating the farmers respectfully, um, they, you know, the, the farmers will make introductions to other people and they're able to kind of move out from the initial set of farmers to, to additional farmers. Um, the other one is uh, similar with um, in the healthcare space where I do a lot of my work. Um, you know, I think what we found to be particularly effective is to, um, you know, reach out to, um, you know, you, you typically can find a few people within the med tech sector that can introduce you to, again, a few doctors that are really interested in, um, you know, understanding, uh, you know, or, or, or in helping innovations come along. And then, um, you know, they will introduce you to some of their colleagues um, and that kind of moves on and on through um, hospitals and other, uh, you know, other care organizations. So um, that's, you know, I guess what we've seen is that, you know, you get a few initial connections um, in the space that you're interested in through, you know, potentially your own network or um, through an industry organization, and then uh, branch out from those initial connections um, just by saying, hey, I'm you know, trying to do this research. Would you suggest any of your colleagues, friends um, that would be good to talk to? Um, so um, I hope that that was useful for people. And um, I think we're... Thank you so much. Yes, I'm back. Was that was that the question? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that was absolutely the question, and even though I only caught a portion of the answer, I um, think that uh, uh, telecom is not always uh, stable in Brooklyn either, as it is not in many parts of the world. Um, so with, uh, with that, uh, we are quite over time, but thank you so much, Paul, for staying a little bit longer, and thank you to all of you who have joined us for this webinar. For those of you who are interested in professional development hours for this webinar, the code is listed on the current slide. We will have a recording of this webinar up within a week or so on our professional development page. If your question wasn't addressed and you have a burning desire uh, for an answer, please do email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org, and we encourage you all to join us as members to get information and invitations to the upcoming webinars in our series. With that, I'd like to thank Paul again. Uh, thank everyone for joining us, and we look forward to catching you on our next. Have a fantastic morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you may be. Thank you.